Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. Thank you for joining us. My name is Alison Bashai. I am the principal of Form Function Studio and the curator of this program series, Designed for Everyone. Um, this is the third program in our series, um, which is produced in partnership with DC Public Library and Goethe Institute. And I'm super honored to have um, Brian and Jerome as our presenters today. Um, we will do, be doing a primer on design justice. And this program series is aimed at um, really the, an intro to format is to um, give people kind of an entry point into a, a topic that maybe they haven't uh, dove into yet. And so that's what we're gonna do today. Um, and now I'm gonna hand you over to Brian who's gonna introduce himself and get us started. Thank you, Allison. I much appreciate it. All right, so I'm going to show I believe I'm showing my screen. <laughs> Are people able to see this? Yes, we can see your screen. OK, fantastic. Um, all right, so let me just put this on presentation mode and then get us moving. Okay, so again, uh, my name is Brian Lee. I am the principal for uh, a firm called Co-Locate Design in New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, I have a history that is attached to design justice. Uh, in that we uh, really started to think about what spatial design justice looks like in 2014 here in New Orleans, Louisiana, uh, 2012 through our uh, program called Project Pipeline with the National Organiz Organization of Mi Minority Architects. We started talking about uh, social justice through architecture and design. Um, what did that mean and how might we start to connect? Uh, those those dots and so as 2014 came to be uh, uh, came into action and we start, started to see uh, and feel all of the protests in the street uh, after Trayvon Martin and as we got into 2015 and we saw uh, Mike Brown we started to see these connections being even more uh, prevalent and resonant in our work and so we uh, made sure that we could start to codify and catalyze that language around uh, design justice and so um, in 2017, I uh, decided to leave a position uh, with the Arts Council of New Orleans uh, and start a practice. I've been in, uh, in, in architectural practice for about 10 years before I, I moved to the Arts Council and wanted to get back to, to working in architecture in a more um, direct and distinct way. And so I say all that to say that, you know, as we're starting to think about what uh, design meant to us, we really boiled it down into this very specific uh, conversation. And it was really around the ethos of our work, which started to talk about um, an acknowledgement and exploration of the connectedness, uh, the intersectionality of our of our plight, of our fights, uh, and how might we start to recognize them so that we can do better moving forward. Uh, and so we came to this this kind of idea around colloquial location, uh, and the intention was to say uh, co co uh, colloquial, meaning the kind of sophisticatedly informal use of formal language, and location is of a place. And so starting to ask ourselves that that very simple question. What does, uh, what does the language of a place mean to us? Uh, and so co-locate was born. Uh, and then that question turned into the actual definition, which talks about the sequence of people and places habitually juxtaposed with one another at a greater frequency than chance. Uh, and, and, and so co-locate started to, to take on that vibe uh, for all of our work. Um, and the recognition very early on that our collective values are validated through the spaces and places that we design. And that's not just us, but that's every other uh, principal actor in the built environment. And we have to recognize that those stories and those histories and those moments 
reflect uh, in perpetuity in the physical environment. And so those decisions that we make uh, so blatantly, uh, falsely in, in, in the early stages of design without recognition and consideration for those who are going to be most severely impacted potentially uh, by our design decisions um, has to be considered. Uh, and I would say even more than, than some of the other considerations that we often uh, think about. Uh, I, I point to the, the, the conversation of, of um, you know, our, our forefather and forebearers uh, like Cornell West, who talks about justice is what love, love looks like in public, public place or in public. And we often talk about and we edit that conversation to say design justice then is what love looks like in public spaces. Uh, design should be a deep expression of care uh, for a beloved community and expression in physical form. Um, and so we believe that for nearly every injustice in the world, there's an architecture, a plan, a design that sustains it. The root of all of that oppression, uh, whether we're talking about climate change or uh, housing, uh, transportation, economic injustice, uh, all of these things are rooted, police brutality, they are all rooted in some form of, of control relative to physical space. Um, and, and if we're not in recognition of, of the way that we design our physical spaces, our cities, our built environment, then we are going to fail at all of the larger systemic issues that we believe that we want to challenge in this world. Just the simple fact of climate change uh, being a factor of, of, of carbon emissions and, and energy use, but energy use and carbon uh, emissions taking up nearly 40% uh, of, of, of uh, both of those issues states very clearly that as we ignore the impact of the phys physical uh, environment, uh, it will be to our continued detriment. And so to root ourselves in what design justice, at least specifically spatial design justice means uh, for us, it is really this: these two simple critical things um, that expand into a multitude of other uh, demands and, and, and process steps that allow us to kind of move forward in this work. And really it just says that, again, we are seeking a, a radical vision uh, for racial, social, and cultural reparation through the processes and outcomes of design. Now, that requires us to think about A, what radical means, what, uh, and then B, what the process and outcomes mean. This is not simply about creating something beautiful and, uh, and then leaving and walking away and, and just assuming that uh, society or the people that, uh, that engage with whatever you create will be, uh, be able to be sustained by that. A process requires people to have attachment and connection. Uh, and oftentimes when we do design things in, in people's, in or around uh, people's communities, we neglect that there has to be some version of a connection between place, people, and space. And then we urge you to be radical, and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, moving forward. Um, secondarily, design justice seeks to challenge privilege and power structures, right? It, it seeks to challenge those privilege and power structures specifically um, so that we can, uh, those privilege and power structures that use architecture and design as a tool of oppression. So how are we how are we mitigating, preventing um, uh, the use of the physical environment as a tool to maintain and sustain injustice uh, over time. So that also means that we have to consider um, what it, you know, our, our tactical demands, right? What are the tactical demands of design justice? Um, most recently, you may uh, have seen the Design uh, as Protest Collective or the DAP Collective. Uh, and the DAP Collective was really uh, a, a outgrowth of uh, DAP workshops that we ran for so many, uh, so many years, and so many new people have joined on uh, that the collective, the coalition, uh, the movement around design justice, specifically against spatial design justice, has grown uh, as an outgrowth of those sets of conversations. But the expectations are very clear out of uh, out of that work, and it really just says that we have to divest. From, uh, from designing and uh, reallocate the funds uh, from the carceral state writ large, but specifically from the, the kind of territorial 
uh, expansion that happens in communities, whether that's jail expansion, whether that's police uh, expansion, uh, police station expansion in those those uh, spaces. We need to end the design of prisons and, and police stations uh, altogether. We need to uh, reflect uh, the spatial injustice in our design training and licensure. So we need to make sure that we are talking about this, not just in design training and licensure, but more broadly in society as a, as a civic condition. Uh, we need to understand what has been embedded uh, in our physical environment so that we uh, can can not just move forward with that knowledge, but we can actively dismantle the conditions that, again, reproduce outcomes uh, of injustice. Now, we're then tasked with understanding the underlying conditions within architecture and design that continue to sustain uh, that work. So we want to end uh, SEPTED practices or crime prevention through, uh, through environmental design tactics, defensible space tactics. Uh, we want to enhance the self self-determination of our communities uh, as we are working to build uh, neighborhoods that are stronger uh, and reinvigorated. Uh, we want to reimagine financial models that are not centered solely on the uh, financial marketplace to determine what's good and what's valuable in, in, in communities. We want to change uh, the way that our service model works so that we are engaging uh, not just with uh, others communities but we are active in our own communities um, and not just chasing uh, a dollar we want to shift public policies there's so much wrapped up in public policy and everyone knows the the very easy one uh, the top of mind one uh, around uh, redlining but but some folks have seen uh, sundown towns recently uh, given the Lovecraft nation that, that that just came out some people have seen and understood the, the kind of uh, perpetual, uh, vagrancy laws across uh, most cities and states that activate uh, police use of, of, of force oftentimes. Um, beyond that, we want to preserve and invest uh, in Black cultural spaces, and cultural spaces writ large that maintain um, uh, the stories and narratives of people uh, who have been historically uh, marginalized from creating and determining their outcomes in physical space. And then we want to redefine the metrics that determine what affordable neighborhoods are. And that requires us first to understand the difference between neighborhood and community. You see, neighborhoods require uh, just the geographic boundary of place. Uh, but but communities are the kind of heart and soul. They are the, the kind of squishy uh, people, uh, kind of uh, uh, tendon that, that ties everything together. Now, uh, communities are attached and have an affinity to the physical space of neighborhoods, but they are not the same thing. Uh, and so we have to recognize that communities themselves can be ripped apart from neighborhoods. And if we actually want to uh, keep them uh, in place and we actually want to build stronger, more valuable, uh, more uh, cohesive and, and permeable uh, com communities, we actually need the neighborhoods that support that set of interactions and it means that we have to shift what we believe again is valuable to all um, so in doing so that means that there's always got to there has always got to be a a sincere understanding of power uh in place we have to sorry we have to consider the signals and the receivers that we are sending out and 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 catching right um, the design profession, again, is like an institution, like any other institution. It sends out signals to tell us our value and our worth, and we do that through the pedagogy, the policies and procedures that are out there, uh, and then the receivers, the practice, the projects, the people. We are all taking in those signals that are coming from uh, what we've been taught, the ideologies we've been taught, the codification of that ideology and the implementation of, of that ideology. And so we know just very simply that when we have racist beliefs, those things, get again, get codified through uh, uh, the FHA or other spaces that started to define what redlining uh, actually ended up being in, in our society. Now, redlining uh, specifically articulated um, a, a disconnect from undesirables in particular communities. And so it didn't call out Black people, but the procedure 
specifically said black people, right? The way in which it was carried out, the way in which it was implemented. And it's key to understand the difference between the two because ultimately uh, we can shift and try to fight and change policies, but if we are not actively seeking to change the way in which procedures are carried out as well, uh, we will miss the boat because those who hold prejudice, those who hold bias uh, and have to implement these strategies will oftentimes rely back on their, um, their the, the, rely on those biases and rely on those prejudices to move things forward. And so we have to be active uh, participants in that conversation. And I'm asking you to think about all of this stuff through the lens of being a radical. And oftentimes people get a little scared of that word, but what I ask you to do is think about its etymology and think about its root. And really that is what it, is what it is, so to speak, right? Uh, it comes from radish. It is really just asking you get to get to the root of things. Um, we should not be scared of, of getting to the root, to the meaning, to the heart uh, of a subject before we start to make decisions. Um, that should be all of our objectives. We should all be radicals. And so ultimately, uh, we've got to find a way to, to just sit with that condition uh, of being a radical and seeking truth and seeking depth and seeking all of the particular nutrients that are that are are, are that we can unearth through the soils uh, that we plant our ground. Um, and so, what does that mean? That means that we often are afraid uh, to you know, to challenge those systems. We we're afraid oftentimes because people don't want to be called racist. They don't really kind of want to have to deal with all of the icky conversations that get tied up into uh, what what it means uh, to have to deal with the historic racism of this specific place. And that's not to say that there isn't a vested interest in, in, in kind of white supremacy across the country, but there is a prevalent specific type of racism that exists here and, and we're afraid of it. And so my advice to you is to get the hell over it. Uh, you are a racist. You exist within a system that is, in fact, racist. And so the only way for you to move uh, through that, because you're not going to move out of it, um, the idea is that you have to acknowledge it, you have to recognize its power, uh, and the ways in which you wield privilege and power to move away from it. I often tell people it's like, being in the rain uh, as soon as you're born, you are essentially drenched in, in the way, in um, the, kind of the systems of the world, and you've got to actively try to dry yourself off. That doesn't mean that if you don't step back out into the world, you won't get wet again. It actually means that you've got to try to create systems that pre prevent you from, from, from uh, falling back into that condition. And so we ask you to think about what it means to be anti-racist, right? It is our obligation to each other. Um, to actively acknowledge the racialized and socialized bias that exists within the systems that we uphold uh, and seek to dismantle our, our own privilege, but others, uh, other privilege and power systems as well. Um, and it's an ongoing process. You're not gonna solve it today. Uh, if you feel like you just came here and you're gonna listen to this and get, get a, a credit or learn something new and then uh, be able to move on as an anti-racist, you're woefully wrong. And so, and so you've got to come to a point where we understand the difference between the isms, uh, the distinct practices, systems, and philosophies of, of whatever those isms are and the operators. And that's where we start to, to try to dig a little deeper. Uh, and what that means is we have to understand that there are so many communities and all of them uh, specifically in a, in a uh, Eurocentric uh, white supremacist system uh, get codified and coded in some fashion, right? And so we have to understand that our communities exist as intersectional conditions, uh, whether it's uh, ethno communities, gender, national, religious, racialized, uh, class, so on and so forth, but all of those being triggered uh, through the lens of, of white supremacy puts value uh, in hierarchical value uh, across those systems. And so when we see those communities being then attached to through a racist lens, um, they they carry those same levels of prejudices or, or varying levels of prejudices according to that. It also means that culture is a result of those pressures and those forces that shape 
about how people move through society. It means that culture is a habit, a tendency, the practices and routines, the patterns that people use uh, to get through the world. And so I often talk to people and just say, look, we're talking about culture as a coping mechanism oftentimes, right? It is the consequence of persistence persistent collective circumstance and immediate individual con conditions. It's the consequence of uh, your grandmother, your great-grandmother, and her great-grandmother all doing very similar things in order to move through the world and shaping the patterns and reliefs that you move through uh, to get where you are today. And then the immediate conditions of your world, your life, your specific uh, decisions, right? And the consequence of both of those things gets us to a point for, point of realization that we can actually move uh, towards uh, a, a better a better understanding of what it means to be in, in culture or in community. Um, and then oftentimes, before I get into some of the work, I'm going to wrap up here shortly, but the intention is to say, let's understand the difference between status quo and liberation, right? We, we often conflate all of these terms, whether it's equality and equity that often get uh, pushed forward or justice and liberation. And, and while we are seeking justice, we are pushing ourselves past justice into liberation. Uh, and so injustice from the very like simple point is just to say that it's, it, it is an imbalance of a system that denies equal distribution of access and resources in order to extract and ma maintain power. All the way on the other end of the spectrum, uh, liberation then requires us to make whole in the present to repair, for past injustices, to remove barriers to progress, and then ultimately to affirm, uh, affirmatively influence future outcomes. And so in this workflow, in this understanding, you can always uh, be pushed back up the continuum if you are not careful. And so we are always seeking decisions that seek liberation and provide uh, distribution of power uh, across that. And so we seek to understand this uh, critical path of decisions that have been made in the past that still hold truth and value in our society and specifically that continue to uphold uh, white supremacist beliefs, uh, whether it's from uh, black codes or uh, Bauhaus and modernism to the Federal Housing Authority in the 30s, um, to the Housing Authority in the 60s, the Federal Highways Act in the 50s that cut through black and brown neighborhoods, the Levitt towns of the world that continue to racially, racially segregate uh, people through physicality of space, uh, septed policies in the 70s uh, and 80s when we started to see um, the, the 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 actual department that we've used uh, that we that we put in place to challenge some of these systems um, continue to cut its budget down to 80 percent of what it was and so it's only ticked back up very uh, a very small bit uh, since the 80s and thusly we haven't uh, protected or sustained our our uh, considerations for public housing um, over that time. So all of these things compiled start to tell us that we do not belong in particular places. Uh, we don't belong. Um, and it may not always look like someone shouting us down, but uh, it does uh, it does say the same thing. Um, and you can see it in the buses and at lunch counters and in schools and in parks. Um, but it takes us uh, recognizing that culture is both evolution and revolution. Um, it is the urgency of now, but it is also uh, a clear vision of what the future might look like. Uh, and so we think about uh, those who have been fighting for so long, both in physical spaces and with our bodies, um, to occupy space in the name of revolution, in the name of rebellion, in the name of, of a just future for all of our uh, kin moving forward. And so. I want to just show uh, a few of these things, whether it's Booker T. Washington, the anchors of design justice, when we talk about Booker T. Washington and Robert Taylor, uh, while I disagree in large part with, with Booker T. Washington's efforts uh, um, around just education as the only way to move people through uh, to success in, in, in a world, he did such a powerful job of creating one of the largest black built uh, uh, spaces uh, to in our country to this day. Now Tuskegee uh, and and Robert Taylor helped build the, the students with at Tuskegee and the and and the professor Robert Taylor helped build every single building or at least most of the buildings uh, um, up until up until the early um, uh, 20th century. And so you're talking about students who built every brick who designed all the plans and who put the thing together. That's pretty amazing. And so when we talk about uh, the counterpart to, to Booker T and we think about uh, W.B. Du Bois who really tied in 
sociological and and kind of urban early kind of uh, urban uh, design urban planning conditions um, he really started to understand the conditions of of uh, uh, our social world in relationship to our physical world uh, through the Philadelphia Negro um, we saw the Rosenwald schools uh, we saw uh, the African American Museum, which took a hundred years um, to see itself get rooted in the ground. We've seen Whitney M. Young, uh, who, who talked about the Kerner Report in some some part, uh, that, which really is the same report we've said over and over and over again in the world that just says we will not solve our larger issues without solving the racial injustice that uh, is permeated through all of our uh, departments uh, in the United States. Um, Jane Jane Jacobs to uh, the Architectural Renewal Committee of Harlem, to the Black Panthers, all occupying space in a way that kept uh, a, a prominent um, uh, voice for what uh, it, it meant to see a future uh, that was, was rooted in justice, rooted in liberation. Mindy Fully Love in the 90s, we saw uh, some of our work uh, within the, um, within uh, co-locate start to resonate with all of that and to tie it back to some of the conversations we've had already we think about this through the continuum of design that we can do things from a design perspective that are individual and ephemeral all the way to collective and permanent and our ask was to think about particular issues around housing uh, with a project uh, called Lights Out, which talked about housing vacancies in New Orleans uh, after Katrina and the uh, immense uh, capacity issues we've had going from 25,000 um, vacant properties and lots to nearly 50 after the storm. What did it mean for us to make sure that we were in community and having, having conversations with the people who are affected uh, uh, most by, by uh, this work? Um, and making sure that we were graphically determining and showing uh, our values in place, making sure that we worked with youth to design some of these things. We posted these uh, all across. We ran for for president in 2015 and 16, and 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 made these these particular signs. Uh, we also kind of talked through and expanded the uh, conversation around what tools were being used. Uh, to maintain that level of oppression. And so pulling down the LA, Con uh, the Louisiana Constitution and denoting the moments that um, can be uh, dismantled, I think is part of this process. Um, whether it's, it's, it's planning for housing or racist monuments, and we we are able to kind of be in community with our uh, our neighbors, talking about the people we want to actually see uh, in our physical environments in the face of all of the kind of uh, again Confederate white supremacist monuments that exist in the South. Whether it was talking about culture or family or legacy, um, we asked artists to tie all of those narratives together and give us posters that represented a contemporary voice on a historic moment. Uh, whether it's people, place, events, and movements uh, that push us a little bit further, uh, we we show those things in 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 not just in in two dimensions, but in three dimensions, and try to see the the funny ones that talk about removing monuments and putting uh, music playing gramophones at the scale of a building uh, on on the pedestals, to the sad ones that talk about the history of slavery in New Orleans, uh, and everything in between. Uh, and then lastly, what does it mean to think about uh, monuments and monuments of white supremacy that don't exist as just simply uh, objects in a field, but are uh, the living definition of, of white, white supremacist policies that cut through black and brown neighborhoods? Um, we talk about the uh, Claiborne Highway and the way in which culture has uh, maintained itself underneath uh, that highway. And so uh, thinking uh, specifically about how we, again, maintain community and are in community through every part of this process. We have conversations with our elders, our youth, uh, business people, artists, uh, larger community members, and they had not just a passing input on this project, but a substantial one, uh, one that shaped uh, the necessity for a particular type of building um, and public space, one that shaped uh, who and how we would start to articulate the physical environment uh, underneath the bridge, and ultimately what art uh, and what conditions needed needed to be maintained uh, around this space. So I want to end here, but ultimately the last thing I'll, I'll say is that 
as we talk about this work, we have to recognize that language, the language we use is important and architecture is a language. Uh, and like all, uh, like all languages, uh, it allows us to tell a story because stories themselves are important and buildings tell our stories. Diverse stories come from diverse cultures and culture itself is obviously important. Culture is the consequence, again, as I mentioned earlier, of a persistent circumstance and immediate conditions. Right, our cities, our neighborhoods, our blocks, they incubate that culture. And for people of color in this space in America, uh, there's power in the places and spaces where our culture is recognized, where our stories are told, and where our language is valued. Because that is not just uh, good design, that is justice. Thank you for your time and energy, and uh, I hope to give it back to you in a little bit. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Brian, for um, kicking us off with um, design justice from the perspective of architecture and the built environment. Um, soon I will hand you over to Jerome, who is going to talk about um, the perspective from graphic design. Um, one thing that I forgot to mention before we started is that we will have a Q&A portion at the end of this program. And at any time you can drop in a, a question and uh, we will select some to choose from at the end. Um, so now let me hand you off to Jerome. Uh, all right. Uh, can, can you guys hear me and see everything all right? Yes, we can. All right, so I was trying to do this from my laptop and I have a keynote, so I'm gonna have to show the video separate from the presentation because I have an old iMac, which uh, I can present from. So I apologize for that. Um, so here we go, Design Justice. Um, that's me, this is Form Function Studio. It's time for everyone's theories um, today. Yeah. Uh, I always kind of give my bio in the places that I live because I'm such a nomad, uh, which is also whatever. Um, so I'm born and raised. I'm from New Haven, Connecticut originally. Um, I went to Temple University, in Philadelphia. I uh, moved to Brooklyn after that, was there for three years, uh, dancing professionally. Uh, moved back to Philadelphia, worked in the school system for a while. Got tired of that, I uh, wanted to go to grad school, so I applied to Yale, got in for the MFA program um, in graphic design. Uh, so I went back home. Um, soon after, uh, three years later, moved to Baltimore. I was teaching at Maryland Institute College of Art and um, moved back to Brooklyn. Um, I was working at Housing Works. If anybody's in New York, that's uh, it's like a, a big, everybody knows it for the thrift store. And then I'm currently in Richmond for no reason other than rent is cheap and <laughs> it's chill down here. <laughs> um, and it's a nice place to work from home. Um, so I guess when I was asked to talk about this, I did, I like uh, emailed Allison. And I was like, I was like, well, what, what, am, what should I talk about? And so these are just kind of like the immediate questions. I'm like, design, am I thinking about design as justice, design like, for justice is justice for design like does justice for what justice for who design for what design for who like um i had never thought about this in the context of graphic design because we are just kind of having our awakening like right now in the past couple of years um especially with black designers a lot of uh, a lot of us have been lecturing about decolonizing um the canon and talking about design education and what's what is considered good design and what's not so but i wasn't considering that design justice so it was, it was hard for me to uh think about this so i just was breaking down the definition of design that so this is just from the uh, merriam webster website uh to create fashion execute or construct according to plan to conceive a plan out in uh, the mind, he had designed it the perfect, oh, sorry, that was like a example of that, um, to have as a purpose, 
to devise for a specific function or a. Um, and then justice, uh, the administration of law, the quality of being just, impartial or fair, um, the principle or idea of just dealing or uh, right action, conformity to this principle or idea, conformity to the truth, fact, or reason, which is, I think that one may be the most uh, relevant in this conversation, but then also like, what is the truth? <laughs> um, so here's a clip of me that would have been, here's his movie. Um, of me that's not there i'm sorry i'm gonna keep going um i came across recently an article that was on vox about powerpoint activism so then i was thinking about this in the context of design activism uh, so this is just me <laughs> on the vox site um and i'm pretty sure you guys have you all have seen this this is people posting just like swipe throughs of kind of um factoids or um kind of many like instagram protest signs and what you can do and resources and things like things like this and i was just questioning its uh legitimacy as a form of justice uh, with lots of biden ads um this girl's uh quote here was was very um poignant because she was saying while you see these like seductive designs make sure you're fact checking for yourself because people could be misinforming you um and then i had another clip that was on uh, from the new yorker i really like the that graphic is is amazing but um so is the, is the second act of social social media activism um it was this, this is a quick read and it's nice but like just people posting these beautiful graphics um with like a simple message you know just like a, a internet uh protest sign and like does that really count as uh activism so for me i think the most reductive way to think about um design justice like if i was to just craft a quick reduct like super reductive definition is this um, design it's designed that advocates for the fair and equitable treatment of people who are more frequently not white and straight in a non performative way. So it's like when P, if it, I think if you're just doing the thing and it's benevolent to a population, that's cool. But if you're doing the thing and you're saying, I'm performing design justice, like, uh, I don't know. Um, and then just like work that centers white straight folks must much less often and it's like unfortunate that that's what it gets boiled down to but it's like white people are like <laughs> at the forefront of of everything or uh i don't want to talk about that like appropriation but that's a whole other lecture but why why is this not the default like why is it why is it such that this is <laughs> uh this is the case so there's this meme, the, the for me thing. So I was thinking it's the white supremacy, systematic racism, and the patriarchy for me. Um, this would have been my work, but um, uh, I can't use Keynote on my iMac. So I'm going to skip forward. Um, but I think calling the work, my work, and the work of the people that I'm about to show design justice is reductive because it's more sophisticated than that. It's uh, the work is a commit uh, is uh, committed to a design philosophy that allows the practitioner to, oh, sorry. The work is committed to a design philosophy that allows the practitioner to generate authentic work that is benevolent to a population by default. So inherently the work that is created, I think my work is, uh, uh, people always say this is such important work. This is really powerful, Jerome. And I'm like, I just this is just what I do, you know. So it's like, uh, and I feel like a lot of important graphic design work, in part, it just it just if I'm just speaking about graphic design, um, the stuff that is the most powerful, it was created out of authenticity and not with the uh, idea of like political impact in mind. Um, but I do think about, for example. Uh, modernism, 
um, is modernism design justice. You know, all these white men got together and said, um, we're tired of these antiquated, overly ornate uh, ways of making things. Let's streamline everything. Let's embrace technology. Um, and like, so so was, was that justice, you know? Um, it was kind of, it did have a radical a root in, you know, a, a radical philosophy, but, um, you know, that's, is that not the case anymore? So that's just, I don't know, just throwing it out there. Um, so now I'm just going to do kind of an examination of design that is benevolent by default um, by these people. And these are people who I just have encountered in my life um, when I was teaching at MICA. Um, uh, just people I went to grad school with, people I spoke at conferences with, people I ran, ran into on the street, and then um, re more recently, one of my coworkers. Um, is this, can everybody, I don't even, I don't, I, I don't see anybody. Is, there, is everybody hearing me and seeing everything okay? Maybe? Yeah? Yes. yes. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to start off with, uh, Joseph Orzal. Um, Joseph was a, uh, uh, master's student at MICA when I was there. I was a, um, thesis advisor. So I would just come talk to them mostly about graphic design. And, um, this is Joseph's Instagram and, uh, organization Nomu Nomu. Um, and it, he leads a lot of, he does a lot of organizing, um, if there's any political action, um, he's promoting that, but he's totally like a, a preservationist of, um, specifically, um, DC culture. And, um, uh, you know, if like, for example, we'll get to the rent strike graphic, or this was like a go-go event. Um, and you know, in DC, there was this huge thing where uh, Google -Go Music was ha was being attacked by the city, and um, they fought back. You know, that's they, that's where the music came from. Um, but definitely, like uh, in the context of design, because I don't know if Joseph considers himself a graphic designer, but there is definitely like a brand identity system in here that's really cool and funky, and it totally makes sense for um, the kind of work that he does. Um, That's Joseph. Uh, next we'll go to Josh Gamma. Josh was also a student at uh, Micah's curatorial practice program. Where's Josh? And um, he is currently the design director at of Current Movement in DC. Current Movement. Um, is an organization that connects activists, organizers, um, and other people working um, in like radical organizations um, with filmmakers, artists, designers, um, and just gives them a voice in the platform um, and beautiful things. Also, Josh is a uh, graphic designer as well, so he's also created this really cool um kind of brand identity system for current movement and um yeah um and just like thinking about the work of joseph and josh for example if i was to ask myself is this design justice uh, i mean <laughs> i don't know it's just like the work that they do um is it benevolent is it helping me any helping anybody of course but is it design justice? I don't know. Um, I do think about the book that was put out by MIT about design justice, um, but I don't. I didn't. I didn't read it because I just found out about it once I had to do this talk. But you know, just trying to put together examples that I think that I thought encapsulated it. Um, this project that's going to pop up now um, was really cool. It was a crossover between Joseph Nomu Nomu and Current Movement where Joseph hired um, poster designers in Peru to make these really cool protest signs. Okay. Oh yeah, well we can enjoy more of Josh's uh, design work, but you guys get it. 
Um, so we'll move on. While I was teaching at MICA, Natalie Hawkins was one of my students. Um, after the whole um, Floyd situation, um, she took the action and started an organization called Design for Black Lives, which pairs um, graphic designers who offers their service, their pro bono service for activists and advocacy groups. Um, so this, and as you can see, she's, she's an amazing graphic designer um, and she could be using these skills anywhere, but just, you know, uh, out of urgency and the need for um, the, the competitions, especially on social media to have slick and beautiful design, offering these services for free different, definitely give um, activists and advocacy groups a, a leg up when people are scrolling down their feed. Uh, yep. I'll just move I'm just gonna go forward to uh, the Design for Black Lives page. And here, in addition to um, uh, you know offering their offering their volunteer services, they also feature readings um, and also graphic designers who um, who are either working for them or who they want to feature um, on the page. Um, I'm also going to talk about another one of my students, Connie. Um, Connie Zhang, Zhang is um, the graphic designer. She just graduated from uh, Maryland Institute College of Art, but while she was a student there, she did a thesis, which was kind of a uh, exploration of typography in Chinatown um, in Philadelphia. In Chinatown in Philadelphia, and this is just like on different signage. So um, she talked about how they how uh, they were really creative and they had uh, very little space to work with and they had to use two languages. So they would mix and match typefaces and this would look really tacky to um, an American, uh, the American kind of like consumerist taste. But I mean, if you, it's actually really cool experimental typography um as connie shows us and she even kind of categorized the type of compositions and the use of and the combination of typefaces um which i think is really clever and also just kind of like uh elevates the idea of this as maybe a, a um course of study um kind of uh typography out of need so i think next time you walk through chinatown maybe just look up and think of connie's work there she is. All right. um, and next, uh, Elaine Lopez. So um, I left MICA in 2019, in the spring of 2019, 2019, 2019, yeah, 20, last year. And Elaine kind of stepped in um, into my place, and she's just as uh, funky as me. So go to her page. Um, so um, Elaine is amazing. She has this uh, wonderful um, bookmaking project that she has called Bound Together, where she asks, she gives people the prompts, and then they make a little book about it. And she has these long um, wire coils, and she, everybody binds their books together. And it's just a nice uh, symbolic way to uh, represent community and kind of. Um, a shared sentiment through graphic design and bookmaking. Um, she's also a master risograph printer <laughs> and teaches that at MICA as well. And let's move forward. And she has she has this exhibition, Making Common, which brings together um, uh, faculty and uh, students and practicing designers and um, just puts their experiences on an, e on an equal plane, whereas there, there's a, originally that hierarchy and that hierarchy gets broken here and everybody's work 
is seen on the same uh, on the same level. Um, I'm going to move forward to the making common website, and you guys can read that. All right, you guys got it. And um, the she did the show in uh, in Baltimore at MICA, and then the show also um, was on view in San Francisco at San Francisco State University. And here's a little more information about Bounce Together. So, All right, cool. Um, Ari Milenciano, uh, we met at the um, uh, Black and Design Conference at Harvard. We, we, we spoke on a panel together and um, I was just taking, I was just blown away by her work. I just listed designer here and as I'm like making, as I was rushing to make these slides, but she is so much more than that. She's a artist, designer, technologist, researcher, educator, and organizer to the max. She has a festival called, festival called Afrotechtopia, um, and she invites uh, different Black artists who work with technology to uh, envision their future with the technology and, and Imagine this how society will use it, and or imagine you know just just and just being black futurists in a way, just thinking forward. Um, and her work is amazing. Um, and um, she has this a program called the Imaginarium, where she it's just an extension of the Afrotechtopia. So she just. Um, brings out black technologists, designers, researchers to just project their work forward um, and imagine imagine their future and not just react to white supremacy, but to actually determine what the future will be. All right, let's keep it going. Um, Shira Enbar, um, she, Shira was actually one of my TAs when I was in grad school. Um, she was a few years ahead of me, but now she is a master graphic designer, um, with, uh, well, I mean, she, <laughs> she probably wouldn't, um, uh, she'd probably be modest about this, but she's a master motion graphics designer, just beautiful work. But um, I specifically want to talk about her um, response to the migrant children being separated from their parents a few years ago. Um, and she worked on this book called Separated. Um, and it's just like a, like a couple of different broadsheets, but it was a collaborative effort. So she asked, well, I was also included, a bunch of us to create um, a spread in the new in the uh, in the book, and um, and just ask for a visual response to what was going on with immigration. Um, let's see. I'm gonna get fo move forward to the uh, to the spread. Yeah, amazing work. All right. Design justice. All right, here we go. Nazi. Nazi is everything. She's also, she's also one of my mentors, but uh, she has a uh, 
organization that does a little bit of everything, a little bit of publishing. They do um, films. Um, they release the books some writers can give you to Heartbeat, um, lecture series, and um, and the, the work is centered around her uh, bringing in Zimbabwe. And, um, or not all of it, but the just this book in particular. And um, move forward to next one. Uh, so Black Chalk & Co. is a creative agency bringing together writers, artists, designers, academics, and technologists with a mutual interest in publishing, curating, conversation, and exhibition, and facilitating teaching residency. Uh, you guys can read the rest, check out the website, but also, uh, is this design justice? It might, or is it just like necessary? Um, the Black School, the Shani Peters and Joseph, I cannot, I don't know how to pronounce that name right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, so the Black School is a radical, and I don't even say, I won't even say radical, I'll say necessary, um, kind of collective. It's it's Joseph and and, Sha, and his partner Shani, and they go into the public school system and give students um, image making. Uh, skills, teach them about their Black history, and they also have these cards, that, which are their um, kind of objectives. Um, let's see. I keep wanting to click the video, like I can interact with it, but that's not the case. Um, and these are just, these just kind of sum up their values. It's an amazing set of cards. Um, I just did it again. And yeah, this beautiful work. I went to a workshop with them in New York and we, we, we had, there was a pyramid building workshop, which was amazing. <laughs> it was like one of the coolest uh, interactive uh, events I've, I've been to. And I came across them for the first time. They had an exhibition at the new museum a couple summers ago and I, my mind was just completely blown. Um, and I've just been interested in just trying to find a reason to work with them since, but they're busy, I'm busy. And then COVID-19. Um, and then last but not least is uh, Russ Jackson. Uh, and Rush is a, Rush is a artist first and foremost, I, I would say, but um, also an awesome graphic designer. Rush create, uh, designed the um, the new Black Vanguard book by uh, what's this, Antoine Sargent. There it is, and um, that was the first time I had, had ever seen their work, and I I was I lost my mind. Um, uh, eventually, Rush ended up applying to Housing Works when I was there and coming on board as a designer, and we ended up hitting it off and collaborating on multiple things after that. Um, one of them being uh, To the Front, the next book that's going to pop up here. Um, so Rush, I would say Rush took most of the creative lead and I just uh, kind of advised on typeface selection um, and just did a lot of the type typesetting, but definitely the colors and um, his uh, their painter lead uh, kind of compositional sensibilities are just all, <laughs> all there. I can't take credit for that. Uh, and then this is just another motion graphic promoting the book. And I also just wanted to point out that we uh, decided to work with uh, Black Type Foundry. So we worked with Vocal Type, which is Trey Seals, and then uh, worked with Freight by Joshua Darden, another uh, Black type designer in New York City. Okay, sorry, I was just kind of distracted because I was preparing to do that all in one presentation, but 
uh, please forgive me. So I don't know if design justice is necessarily the correct term. I think maybe uh, design as a necessary, urgent, and empathetic, and or celebratory response um, should be a natural impulse for us all. And I'm assuming that everybody watching this is a designer um, or design adjacent. But like, I feel like it should just be like natural. When something happens, why would you not want to address it with uh, with design, like why would you continue to make design about cats or I don't know, whatever else people design about. Um, so if this isn't like common sense for you, I would suggest um, integrating the celebration of all cultures and identities into your design practice and respond to injustice with strategic, flexible and enduring initiatives. And I'm, and I'm the reason why I think I'm saying strategic and enduring in particular is because uh, after uh, George Floyd was murdered, um, I my inbox was flooded with opportunities to do freelance work and to speak and to do things like this. And it, and it seemed like fleeting impulses um, <laughs> responses to, fuck, we could, let's find a black designer to do something about this. Um, and I was just, and I myself was already, was already like emotionally taxed with COVID-19 and, and, and racism in general. And it's, it was just too much, right? So like I'm being asked to do labor at this moment and a lot, it was a lot. But um, what I will say is that uh, another thing that needs to be recognized is the hegemony of white and Eurocentric design methods and design. Um, I think this in particular is just something like once you notice it, it's just kind of like there is work to be done. You can do your own research on all the different other uh, ways to approach design. Like they, there's this guy, I think his name is Igbo Excellence on Twitter. He did an entire thread of every single different style of architecture in Africa. And I was like, shit, I didn't know all this. Like all, Like every single kind of region has its own different um, kind of aesthetic and specific materials they're using um, and decorative elements in buildings. And it, it totally blew my mind. I didn't know this while I'm looking at all of this like modernist, brutalist stuff. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry this was a sloppy talk, but uh, hopefully the information is there for you guys. And feel free to ask me questions to clarify uh, anything I might have rushed through in the talk. And then you can follow all those people. Just take a screenshot. All right, I'm done, I think. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jerome. Um, okay. A lot of people have been asking whether or not the uh, slides from the presentation will be available. So I will uh, check with what you both offline if you're willing to share. And if so, um, we'll okay. share the attendees. Um, so now we're going to move into the Q and A portion. Um, if if everyone um, would like to drop their questions in, there are a handful of questions in already. Um, I will start with with the ones that we have. Um, this first question is for um, Brian specifically. This is this question is from Justin Taplet. He asked. Um, design justice encompasses so many factors beyond the traditional role of an architect's uh, basic services. So what are some practical actions we can implement in daily practice to have the greatest impact on realizing design justice? Oh, well, the first thing is that, what up, Jack? Um, first, <laughs> uh, the, the first thing I would say is that it doesn't have to exist without our, uh, beyond our scope. Now we've redefined our scope from, you know, Kind of schematic design through, uh, through CA, um, and we we've left space to add programming and pre-design within that. But ultimately, we can start to shift and shape our scope a little bit more broadly. That's uh, the only way that we've been able to, as a practice, kind of grow and expand beyond uh, our current work is to make sure that uh, within our contracts, within uh, the way we lay out our projects. Um, the uh, not just the engagement, uh, but the training of uh, our clients, our uh, design partners, our 
consultant team are all tied into the, the, the theory and practice of design justice uh, more broadly and anchors itself in, in critical race theory as a, as a form of, of influence on the design from start to finish. And so the first thing I would say is, is mostly make sure that your contracts include um, uh, the necessary anchoring of design justice and critical race theory uh, at the front end. Uh, and then I think the the second thing I would say, sorry, real quick, is just making sure that uh, the the tools and the manner in which you um, invest in community throughout uh, each phase of design is articulated from the top of of uh, the top of your project, right? So as you're doing a a schedule uh, throughout a project. Uh, what are the checkpoints? What are the decision points? The kind of critical path uh, for the decisions of the architecture itself, and then tie in the critical critical path for the uh, the community response uh, in as well. So it requires kind of a double coordination, but a necessary coordination. Allison, I think you're muted. Oh yeah, you're muted, Allison. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, this next question uh, is from Jill. This uh, Jill asks, would love to hear your thoughts on how we better mentor kids into the design and architecture profession. I'll add in graphic design as well um, to get the voices in the room. Jerome, you want to start that one off? I'm sorry. What was the question? Say it again. The question was, how do we better mentor kids um, into the design professions um, to get the voices in the room? Jill asks. How, how to better mentor kids? I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, like, I, I mean, I think that uh, I'll say this. I was like, I didn't even know that. I, I was doing graphic design before I even knew it had a name. I was putting words and images on a paper for people to to absorb. Like I was making printed ephemera for a very long time, and then even in college, for a side hustle, I was making party flyers. So like um, I didn't know it was called graphic design until I was in college, you know. So I so like um, I think it might just be um, like uh, letting young uh, black kids or their kids of color know that there are career paths that aren't being a lawyer, a doctor or fireman or something, but you can be an architect. You can't, you know, you can be a designer, you know, you can, you know, these things do exist. I think even just just opening the door period, just saying this this is also a possibility is is just he's enough. <laughs> yeah. Um let me let me build on that a little bit in that, you know, so so we just finished a, a our uh youth high school camp, uh, architecture camp this past weekend. And uh, we've been running this camp for uh, almost 15 years. And and one of those couple couple notes that we picked up, we've we've worked with nearly, I'm gonna say around 12 uh, 12,000 to 13,000 kids over the course of that time frame. And um, the numbers haven't shifted all that much, right? When we talk about uh, the influence of, of black and brown youth in the architectural profession, um, the numbers haven't shifted all that much. And so the big thing there that I try to point out is that it can't be simply about trying to increase numbers. It has to be about uh, you know giving folks reason, access, removing barriers, um, and and again affirmatively influencing their future outcomes. And so uh, you know even hosting a camp, which I'm extremely proud of, and I, I think all of our of our chapters across the country are are, are really proud of. Um, it's not enough to stop there. Uh, and so I think that the 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 way that we can remove barriers, uh, I think Jerome mentioned a, a little bit of it in that we do have to encourage a the, the typology of learning around design that is valued throughout our schooling and not not uh, eschewed or uh, seen as secondary or tertiary to what is considered like core uh, like core curricula um, and then ultimately we've got to provide multiple opportunities one of the things that that happens for young black and brown people is that we don't get the opportunity to 
try and fail again and again and again and succeed again and again and again. We have to, we're always like locked into, okay, well, I'm only going to get this one shot because that's what the system allows me. So I got to do that one thing really well when I get the chance. Um, but really the thing that builds a successful artist, the thing that builds a successful designer is giving young people the opportunity to suck at something for a moment and then to, to, to work to being good. Like it's not easy being an architect, it's not being easy being a graphic designer. You've got to be bad at it before you can be good at it. And so um, we have to give our young people that, the grace for that. Yep. Amazing. Um, this next question is uh, specifically for uh, Brian. Uh, Joe asks, can you please explain, expand on why uh, CPTD is outdated and a better way to design for community as opposed to security? Uh, uh, maybe I don't understand the question, but SEPTED, so uh, crime prevention through environmental design and uh, I'm assuming this is a, a, a stipulation between um, designing physical spaces that deter uh, criminal activity versus having a physical presence of somebody uh, in a space. Well, yes, I, I, I think the worst thing you can do is have uh, uh, overly aggressive physical presence. I, I would not say that that's the, the direction you go. I think it goes the other direction, which would, just, which would be to say that crime prevention through environmental design is often um, is often carried through the lens of, of the police. And so the things we create in our physical spaces um, allow for police to um, accelerate or amplify violence very quickly and to assume um, uh, to often assume that certain folks do not belong in a space. And so when we create a bench uh, outside of a building that um, has little spikes on it so that people can't sit there for too long, or uh, we create all hardscapes and no softscapes and, and, and create spaces that are territorially controlled. I mean, this, these are the, the, the actual definitions and terms uh, that we use, right? Um, territorial control re requires that um, you know, all lines of sight are 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 um, uh, are visible, so that we can start to to move people out of the spaces that we believe shouldn't be there. The last thing, one of the other things, is that natural surveillance is is a is a big part of uh, crime prevention through environmental design. Natural surveillance requires community uh, care. Right. You can't just have people when you have people who don't care about one another um, looking out uh, onto public spaces, they do it with suspicion. And so when we create spaces and places that are not centered on design justice, not centered on the impacts of, of critical race theory um, uh, or an understanding of critical race theory, we're providing and building spaces that build and grow our suspicions of one another and build and grow our ability to to. Um, to accuse one another. Uh, and so SEPTED is not a policy that we want to use when it is through the lens of crime prevention. But uh, what it is, what we, we can start to view is uh, community empowerment or community power uh, through environmental design. Our job is actually to create spaces that form, uh, form and attach uh, community connection over time because when we have again communities that care about one another then we will look out for one another over time uh, it's a long process because we've done so much damage over time uh, but septet is again a tool for oppressors to maintain sets of oppression even if it's a soft thank you um this next question is for Jerome. Uh, Jerome uh, Truman is asking, um, so Truman is a department representative of graphic design at RISD and will be meeting with faculty routine, routine, uh, routinely. And as a student, they want to talk about the des um, design's role in justice and activism to the academic faculty administration. And Truman's asking, how would you recommend um, that I and others in some positions introduce these topics. Um, I would I would start from from the top down. Like I would just ask students what their personal manifesto or philosophy is in, in life. <laughs> you know what I mean? I have been committed to the LGBTQ community, to the Black community, to people of color, marginalized voices, 
for a very long time now. You know, like I I had I grew up as a little black boy and I knew I saw what the world was very early. And so like I committed my career to that community, you know what I mean? So like I a, a lot of my work, most of my work is um for or with these people. So I would just say like some kind of personal like you get personal commitment to a goal and I don't think I think that's like um uh that should be 360 as a person and then apply that to your design practice and i think that's the way it should be approached i I, sh- I, sh- I don't think you should say go work for a nonprofit. i don't think you should say um design a protest sign you know what i mean maybe that's not the best way to go about it maybe you want to um uh art direct a I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like there's other ways to go about it, but I feel like it needs to it needs to trickle down into every single aspect of your design practice. And you need to know what you're not what you are going to do and what you're not going to do, because not every but not the same um, implementation of not not the same implementation works for everybody. Not every designer is the same. So, yeah. Thank you. I will give one last one. And this is for both speakers. This question is from Victoria. Victoria um, is wondering about your design process. Uh, They say, I think about design justice as being rooted in the process of who you design for and with. For example, who is allowed slash given opportunity to participate? And so who is harmed or benefiting from this? Um, So there, Victoria is reiterating, can you speak to your own process of design and how to bring justice into it? No, you wanna? Sure, I can go. Um, I think I think you're right. It anchors itself, uh, as we talked about a little bit earlier, in who holds power, right? The kind of five core questions that we start with when we talk about any project through the lens of design justice is, uh, you know, who holds power? Where does that power? Where does that power? Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, what's the resulting injustice, right? So power, uh, distribution of power equals um, uh, excess uh, uh, power in some quarters and a, a lack or dearth of power in others. And so that dearth of power is the injustice. So who who holds power is the first thing. Where does that where does that justice uh, or injustice lie? Who is directly and disproportionately uh, marginalized by way of that injustice? Uh, how does it physically, for us, again, how does it physically show up in the physical environment? So what decisions have been made to manifest that injustice in the physical environment? And then ultimately, how can we challenge uh, through process and outcomes uh, that injustice and that power? Uh, and so as you mentioned, it is ultimately rooted in that. But we start with a power analysis and we try to make sure we understand uh, both the issues at hand, but who controls and can continue to perpetuate that that injustice. It might mean then that we uh, go in and make sure that we are identifying the most marginalized and working uh, either with hiring uh, uh, folks from that uh, particular marginalized environment. And I, and I understand the difference between, again, you know, again, from a graphic design perspective versus an architecture stamp, standpoint, they're, they're, they're different aspects, uh, but also uh, have some some conditional relationship. Uh, but but our job, again, is to, to take um, take that moment, understand who's most marginalized, make sure that they are vested into the process, uh, and then ultimately uh, seek an outcome that is is a resolution not for a specific client, but for a user, right? Like who who is going to be most impacted by this? They should have um, decision making power um, in in that work. So whatever power I have through the process, or we have through the process of design we try to redistribute it as much as possible to the communities we serve. Yeah. Um, it's funny because because uh, because architects deal in space and 3D things and graphic designers make flat things. <laughs> so yeah. like, I, I only have to think about somebody using their eyes to engage with my work a lot, you know, a lot of times. So um, it's funny. Also, we kind of match Brian, so. Yeah, I see. <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. But I, but I was my as far as my design process goes, um, I'm, I you know I've been working uh, for institutions or for organizations for a while now, so I have to, um, you know, I have to. It, it, my uh, everybody in the organization basically is basically my internal client, 
so I have to work for them. But in my personal practice, I definitely lo- um, very much um, love collaboration. I love making work, like uh, Brian was saying, I like making work that I get to like just fuck around and 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 make ugly stuff or make stuff, make, experiment with uh, new things. Um, I like to, if we if we if we're thinking back to um, my uh, me and Rush's collaboration on the woman's um, black woman suffragette um, book, um, we used t- design typefaces by two black designers who were just who were perfectly fine, and, and it came out as a beautiful book. So I just do I do think that I just try to when it comes to the process, you know, designers make a whole bunch of little decisions along the way. And I try to make everyone intentional and make sure it's uh, when I get to <laughs> speak back about it, like in this case, um, there is an impact and I do get to share knowledge with people. So there is that uh, that feedback loop of um, it just intent, like being intentional throughout the process, you know. Thank you both so much. Um, I also want to thank everyone for attending today. For those of you who might have joined later or who have um, friends or colleagues who wanted to uh, take part in, in today's program, we will be uploading a link to, um, to YouTube and sharing that link with everyone who registered. So um, look out for that. And um, hopefully you all will be able to connect uh, with us um, myself, Brian, Jerome, DCPL, Goethe Institute, um, offline, and um, look out for the rest of our series. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Be safe.